welcome back uh, to the HT Summit. And let me tell you about our next session. One of the things that the pandemic taught us, apart from, of course, appreciating good health and the blessings, all the blessings that we have, it also taught us about the importance and privilege of being able to travel. We stayed home, we could work from anywhere, but you had to use your imagination to think of other locations because lockdowns were everywhere. And even now, with the new variant Omicron, we're all vaccinated and ready to travel and see the world, but the threat of lockdowns and flights being canceled is again everywhere. So what does the hospitality industry do? Let's hear it from Sonushiv Dasani, who is in conversation with my colleague and HT Brunch editor, Jamal Sheikh. Over to you. Thank you, Sunetra. Sonu Shivdasani, welcome to the 19th Hindustan Times Leadership Summit, where our theme for the year, after an ex unexpected period of unexpected challenges, is the new world order. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure, Jamal. Jamal, it's a great honor. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you also to Shabana and Hindustan Times. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here. Today. The last time I saw you, Mr. Shivdasani, you were setting a new world order of your own. This was the end of summer 2020 when the world was just about coming out of lockdown and the Maldives was opening up. And you got online promising Indian travelers a private jet to fly directly into an airstrip close to your resort, bypassing the busy airport at Malé and avoiding any unnecessary contact. You also promised something that I've never heard anyone promise before. You told your prospective guests with aplomb that if you contract COVID while you're staying with us, we will host you till you've recovered free of cost. That was a bit of a maverick move, wasn't it, Sonu? Did it work for you? <laughs> uh, yes, it did. Um, it, it, it got travel kickstarted again because uh, back in the summer of 2020, there weren't connections between India and the Maldives and in particular the key cities like Bombay and Delhi, um, the flights had stopped. So. Um, we started this charter. It worked well. I think we had about five or six charters where we just filled it up with with clients and um, reassuring people that if they had COVID, that they wouldn't have to pay for a holiday because the last thing people want to do is pay for a holiday and then end up locked up in their villa. So we we did that and we 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 stayed true to it. We honoured that uh, promise. And over the time, because because we're one island, one resort, what we realised um, very early on um, in the pandemic was that uh, especially with um, Suneva Fushi, where Ava and I were, we, we decided to stay the lockdown in, in the Maldives at Suneva Fushi. And we managed to get about 70 guests who decided they weren't going to leave the Maldives. All the other resorts closed. We deliberately decided to stay open uh, at, um, at Suneva Fushi because what we realize is that the true asset of Suneva it's not the largest lead-in villas in the world or the elaborate selection of sort of dining options or the spas we created when I founded Six Senses and the general wellness that we offer. Um, it's the magical service that the people that occupy our properties create and they're our asset. So we couldn't just close our resorts, let them go home, not pay them, give them notice and not tell them when they'd ever get a job again. So they, they were staying with us. Um, and so we kept our doors open. And, and we found that there were a lot of guests who were in the Maldives were being kicked out of the resorts they were at. And so they all ended up and stayed with us for about two to three months. And we realized this, this, this idea of one island, one resort, where no one came in and out, you got your private island, there was no COVID because everyone had been there for 14 days, was such bliss because the rest of the world, you saw lockdowns, people um, in their homes, in masks no social contact at all. And here were we, 70 lucky people on this beautiful Eden, um, interacting with each other, going out for drinks uh, on a Saturday evening, having a quiz night, um, big dinner parties, drinks parties. And it was like a different world. And so we felt that once the border reopened, we wanted to recreate that. So we decided to set up our own laboratory. We were very lucky. We managed to get one test machine from, uh, from Roche which was rare at the time. There was a shortage of testing equipment. So we managed to get it in. We built our laboratory within two weeks. We got the government permissions very quickly and uh, started testing everyone on arrival. So we created this fantastic environment with no news, no sh shoes, but also no masks. Well, if Instagram is anything to go by, India discovered the Maldives en masse right after this pandemic. Right. Uh, now, Sonu, uh, the love story of Sonu and Eva Shivdasani is the toast of the luxury travel world. 
The two of you met in college, visited the Maldives in the 1990, fell in love with it and with each other, and opened your first resort in 1995. Soneva, your brand is Sonu and Eva. And I'm surprised Bollywood hasn't made a love story on it yet. <laughs> but Sonu, right. there's another love you've nurtured forever. Your love for protecting the planet. Yeah. Where did your love for the environment begin? Point us to that one turning point you said, it's time to do something to correct our wrongs. Yeah, um, I think a couple of things. So um, being, um, I was quite young when we started our project and uh, being a student uh, living in Oxford in the 80s, seeing the impact of Thatcherism, you had these beautiful meadows and countryside that suddenly would become big housing estates with a thousand houses. Um, Ava, was, Ava was Swedish, so she was naturally green uh, right from the beginning. The Swedes saw the impact of, of acid rain and Chernobyl and the terrible e e ecological mismanagement of Russia. It was there on Russia's border, so they felt um, they had all the fallout, literally fallout of that. And so um, we and then we came to a beautiful little and um, at that sort of young age, we felt that a company must have a purpose beyond simply enriching shareholders like Ava and I and our partners and paying employees a salary. And we realized that if we were to do that, we could attract a certain type of person to our organization who would be really engaged and passionate. And as I touched upon earlier, um, the definition of luxury in our industry is not how um, elaborate the, 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 the physical asset is, it's the people, it's the magic. And magical service can only be trained to an extent, it has to be instilled, it has to come from the gut. So if you have a core purpose that goes beyond just simply enriching yourself and your employees, um, it can ring true to them and they feel passionate about the business and they get up every morning being proud Sunavians and wanting to go and create magic for our guests. So it's it sort of works very well. And in fact, that's why we, I think, one of the few hotel companies to won the equivalent of the Oscars, not just for luxury and travel and tourism, but also sustainability for travel and tourism more than once. The World Travel and Tur Tourism Council, the government private sector partnership, gave us their Tourism for Tomorrow Award in 2008, and then again in 2015 uh, when they met in Madrid. And so um, so, so it, 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 it's just been, been very important to us and uh, a big part of our success, I think, uh, uh, this idea of sustainability. And it, it's really ingrained in us. It's not a new fad. It's something that was started at the beginning. It's our core purpose and it's it's our DNA. You know, so, uh, so no, I first saw the top pop you know, glass bottles for water. Uh, for the first time in my lives in a luxury life in my in a luxury resort, when I first visited Soneva Fushi in 2011. Uh, yep. Ten years later, hotels are still struggling to get rid of plastic waste. Is the luxury travel industry doing enough to protect the environment? Is sustainability now a part of the new world order? Um, well, obviously, sustainability has become much more on the agenda because we're seeing the impact of our previous practices, and. Um, and, and and I think we we need to realize that any economic activity um, unfortunately benefits the richest 20 to 30 percent on the planet. So if you think about our activity, uh, travel, um, if you can afford to travel, even if you you fly EasyJet um, or you know a cheap low cost airline, I'm, I can't remember what the Indian equivalent is, or you stay in a budget hotel, you're still amongst the richest 20 percent on the planet. And what you're consuming is impacting on the poorest. So, um, so we need to be aware of that, and um, and we're starting to see the impact of our behavior, our behavior. So, when we think about it, that by 2030 there'll be more plastic in the ocean. On the current trajectory, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. We've exceeded four of the planetary boundaries. I'm not sure if you're aware of this idea of the Stockholm Resilience Center that there are ten planetary boundaries. So we've exceeded four of them. Uh, a billion people don't have access to clean water. Christine Lagarde, a few years ago, the head of the IMF, she pronounced that uh, by 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 2030, um, half of sub-Saharan Africa will no longer be able to grow the crop that it does. And potentially half of the world's population will be living in areas of water stress, including many people in India. Um, you think about Gogaon, the land of golf courses, um, it's just seeping the the water table. So what what we're 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 coming towards the cliff end, and um, that's obviously driving people to uh, towards sustainability. And the good thing is that 
the technology is there, the knowledge is there, the understanding is there. Unfortunately, what's not there yet, and to answer your point, is has the travel industry truly em embraced, um, and the luxury travel industry truly embraced the sustainability? No, only lip service, because there's so much more one can do. And when one puts one's mind to it, um, as I said, the technology is there, um, the opportunities are there, but it's there, it's not being followed through. If you would, if I were to ask you to pick one thing the luxury travel industry needs to do urgently yeah. to save the environment, what would that one thing be? It's a whole list of things. I mean, it's it's a bit like the onion. The first one, um, right on top of the pyramid. I, well, I mean, obviously your carbon, your impact on carbon emissions is 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 a top priority. Um, waste is clearly very important. Um, eliminating the single use of plastic is is another big thing. Um, so I think those, and, and then en engaging in the community. I think one of the big challenges the travel and tourism industry has had, and that's why in certain destinations, it's had such a terrible image is that quite often the travel and tourism industry has created economic output but has not created greater happiness for the local population think of the coast of spain the costa brava you had a lot of gdp but if you were a spaniard living on the costa brava who would go out in the morning and catch fish or if you weren't a fisherman you go to the fisher market fishing market and you'd find cheap fish you'd live on the coast by the beach you'd wake up in the morning you go for a swim and then suddenly the Germans came along, they built these big skyscrapers, created bars, brought in German German employees, brought in German food. Um, real estate prices went through the roof. So um, as, as, a, as a local, you couldn't afford there. You had to go and live in the hills, a bit like what the Spaniards did to the Mayans, you know, when they invaded Latin America. So, you know, they, they, it was a bit of poetic justice. But, um, you know, and and your your um, all, all, all the raw materials just went through the roof. Uh, there was a sort of huge inflationary pressure. So your cost of your your quality of living deteriorated. So I think that's the key thing for a hotel operator to ensure that you are actually benefiting the community around. You're employing locally, you're engaging with the community and um, you're minimizing your impact on the planet. And, and you can well, do that. Let's hope that happens. Uh, let's shift focus a little bit from the industry to the travelers um, and to your guests. How has the luxury traveler, Sonu, changed post-COVID? Have they changed post-COVID? Um, I think um, they're more sensitive as individuals, as human beings. Um, they're more engaged and they thrive um, social interaction. So, you know, what we've found in our um, no news, no shoes and no masks, you know, where we're testing everyone in our COVID-free environments, is that guests love to talk to other guests. I mean, they... Our sort of environments have like-minded people from all over the world and people and we it's in a casual setting so you're not wearing shoes um it's not like some of these hotels where you have to dress up at dinner and where you feel very formal and the moment you feel formal and you're wearing a jacket and shoes you don't feel you can go across to your neighbor and say hello whereas when you're barefoot you can and people create amazing bonds from all over the world and post covid that's that's increased more people are just going and having dinner with other guests because they can't do that back home. And they know they can do it there. They can have a conversation with someone and know that they're COVID free and uh, you know have a laugh together, uh, give someone a hug and um, and then engage more with, with the property. Um, and they want to learn and evolve more. Um, they want to develop themselves. And they're just, I think people are much more sensitive as human beings. I think what's happened is we, uh, you know, we got a bit of a shock um, and our traditional way of being was not for six and and that's always good in a way because it's always good to have that 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 dramatic sort of knock right right so let me ask you the same question uh but with a twist how has the luxury traveler from india changed post-covid how has the luxury traveler from india changed post-covid um i think um i i think quite similar um i mean they're staying a bit longer um, so we're suddenly seeing Indian guests staying for two weeks, which wouldn't have happened before and really enjoying it. And because you, especially in India, life's quite stressful, especially if you're um, very successful, um, you really have to put in the hours. Um, there's a lot of stress. There's quite a lot of pollution. Um, there's a lot of background noise um, and there's a lot of friction, friction, this um, friction to getting things done. You might have a vision and a view and you want to achieve a goal, but there's continuous friction, whether you, the moment you get out of your house, there may be traffic. Um, the moment you want to get something done, there may be some government bureaucracy. All of that friction jars 
and so it takes you a few days to decompress and if you're there for two weeks um you really do unwind completely and this idea of without news um it, it creates that suspension of disbelief and it allows you to really disengage from um what you're doing and engage with the reality we've created right. Uh, let's spend a few minutes talking about the word luxury. You've mm. said before that true luxury is that what is rare. Yeah. Marble, gold taps, etc. do not cut it for you. Spending a week walking barefoot on sand is what does. Yeah. How did you, Sonu, turn walking bare feet into a much coveted luxury? <laughs> well, um, yes, yeah, so we've always wanted to... Um, our core purpose, as I mentioned, uh, you know, we've always had this core purpose, and our core purpose, is, purpose has been slow life, imaginative, engaging slow life. Essentially, we're offering our guests luxuries by, whilst minimizing our impact on the planet and enhancing their health. And we did that by questioning and challenging what really was a luxury. And uh, as, as you touched upon, luxury is not about objects. It's not about gold and marble, and quite often people think it is. It's about that which is rare. And we need to bear in mind that the context of the successful who can afford to stay with us has completely changed over the last 50 years. You know, we've had um, the internet revolution, we've had Thatcherism, Reaganism in the 80s, the internet revolution, we had the BRICS. The world's changed. Um, the rich and the successful are now self-made. They're not the landed gentry. They're living in an urban environment. And what was taken for granted by the successful in the past is now very rare. If you're living in, the, in an urban environment, you might be the richest man uh, in, 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 in the country you, you live in, and you might have a 40 story house, but can you uh, walk barefoot for a week or have that fresh salad that was plucked from the garden? Fresh air is a premium, premium. space, privacy are challenges. Um, having, um, having a shower, uh, listening to the hotel's Bose sound system with your favorite song already downloaded by the hotel's team on, your iP on, on the hotel's iPod and seeing the full moon or watching a movie where the stars are not just on the screen or talking about the stars, seeing the stars through one of the largest telescopes in the Indian Ocean and having someone like the second man on the moon, Buzz Aldrin or Massimo Terengi, who runs the largest telescope in the Atacama Desert, um, or even our own resident astronomer explaining the universe out there. You can't do that in, in, in a city like Bombay or New York or Delhi with a smog. So these become rare, priceless experiences. Now, Maldives is very rich in natural beauty, uh, but Sono, you don't really take away a slice of Maldivian culture when you leave. Is that a challenge you've tried to tackle before? Um, I think you do, in a way, get the sense of the beauty of the people, and you certainly take away a slice of Suneva culture. So, um, funny enough, my title is the guardian of the culture, because I believe that as the CEO of an organization, uh, your job should be to create a culture, to create values and beliefs that, and language. So that's why we don't have employees, we have hosts. Can you imagine walking on an island with 350 employees or an island with 350 hosts? The guest experience is completely different. So language drives behavior. And um, and that's my job. And um, and so there's, there's a very strong Suneva culture that our guests are touched by and which impacts them. And it sometimes changes their lives. Another allegation against the Maldives, that all resorts look the same, they just have different brand names. True or false? Um, generally true, and that's why we sold Stick Senses. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I, I, I sort of believe uh, the challenge with luxury is it's become very institutional. You'll walk down um, a famous high street like Bond Street or um, you know, a luxury airport, and you'll see all of these names, people, names of people who are once passionate about making a dress or um, a piece of luggage or a jewel or a watch. Um, yes. And all of these names are now just owned by a few groups and that's in the luxury section. But you now see that in hospitality, all of these brands, including the brand that I founded and sold, is now owned by one of the four or five big mainstream hotel chains that have a whole garage of brands. And, and the thing is that not, they're not the owners of their hotels, they're the operator. The owner is generally a financial institution. It's a private equity firm, it's a sovereign wealth fund, um, a public company whose sole purpose is to maximize shareholder wealth. They don't have a mission, an idea. When Coco Chanel created that dress, she had a vision on how fashion should be driven. And that's what luxury brands should be about. It should be about individuals who have a view, who have a vision, 
and create something special. And that's not the case at the moment. And um, the risk of luxury hospitality, not just in the Maldives, but anywhere in the world, is that they risk these, these luxury brands risk becoming the intercontinentals and the Sheratons and the Hiltons of the 2030s because they're using the same architects, same designers, same SOPs, quite often the same GMs. You'll see a GM who worked at one luxury brand one year, next next year, something else. And they do look the same. You can change the sign. I mean, there are four luxury hotels in Maldives where if you look at the interior design, it's exactly the same. There's, It's like a shed. They do this a shed thing. It's very long room yeah. and these very long doors. And yeah. there are four of them. And the slight difference is the color scheme is different, but that's it. So so you're, you're quite right. I mean, a lot of luxury hotels um, are becoming nondescript. And then you lose the brand differentiation because at some point, why will someone pay a premium over another hotel who's just discounted their rate? And so that's why we sold Six Senses because we realized we didn't want to manage other people's hotels. We wanted to be both the owner and operator of our hotels because we feel we've got a very strong message and strong values. And we wanted to ensure that we could and that that message was undiluted because we were both the owner and operator of our hotels. And um, and and I think that's um, in, in time will be our strength. And um, yeah. Fantastic. Now, in 2011, you started selling your villas in the Maldives on leasehold. And I remember you saying then that there has been an interest from Indian families. Are wealthy Indians buying tropical homes in the Indian Ocean? Well, funny enough, we've had the interest, but we haven't quite closed on one Indian family yet. So we've, we've sold about 30 residences. And bizarrely, it's to people who, are, who live within eight to 12 hours, you know, more than eight to 12 hours away. So long haul travelers. There's, we don't have a single guest that lives within a four hour distance, but I think that will change. We currently have a lot of Indian prospects. COVID has changed that. Um, it's much easier now. There's a very strong relationship between the Maldives and India. So I think Indians feel there's a sense of security um, of investing in the Maldives now because of the close relationship between the two governments. Um, I think as an Indian, you can um, use Indian currency and, and sort of invest as well. So there are lots of... Um, advantages that the Maldives has because of the close relationship that the Prime Minister Modi and, and the President and President Soli have. And um, and, and I, I think we'll start to see some Indian buyers soon. Let's shift gears and move away from the Maldives for a bit. Like yeah. several other industries, luxury travel has been one of the worst hit as a result of the pandemic. Yeah. What do you think the industry must do now to bounce back? Right. Um, well, I think, yeah, I, I think sort of um, it's a good question. I mean, we're very lucky because we're in remote locations. And so I think what what one needs to do is one needs to offer guests unique experiences that they cherish and treasure and give guests a, a sense of safety. So if you can test people on arrival and create COVID free environments, do that. Um, I, th I think you need to, um, yeah, and, and I think create a unique experiences that are special that people really wish to and yearn to travel for. I think, unfortunately, corporate travel is dead for obvious reasons, um, just like what we're doing now. <laughs> um, so so I think corporate travel is permanently stunted. Um, it will recover from the pre, you know, from, you know, time when there was a complete lockdown and zero travel, but um, it will be half of its historic levels. Because if you think about it, corporate travel is a function of the growth of the economy, yeah. divided by improvement in communication technology. So we had Teams and we had Zoom before COVID, but we didn't have the adoption of this technology. And what COVID did is it fast forwarded the future. So all of this technology, like we're experiencing right here now, was adopted. But you did speak very recently about the pleasure traveler with a B, uh, the yeah. business traveler who stays on at the destination he comes for yeah. leisure. Uh, yeah. Is the pleasure traveler of particular interest to Soneva? Uh, well, we our focus has always been the leisure traveler, and it always will be. And uh, we will eventually have Sonevas in urban environments because I do think that cities will have a recovery. And in, in a way, I think they'll have a really good future. Funny enough, you know, it may be bleak at the moment because you have these hotels that are orientated towards the corporate traveler that are suffering and will continue to suffer. But what will happen is that vacuum that the corporate traveler has created will allow space for the leisure traveler. 
And the leisure, leisure traveler is much more beneficial to the host city because you know, as a holiday maker, you might arrive at midday, you leave your bags in the hotel, you go out for lunch somewhere. You then go shopping in the afternoon. Um, in the evening, you go to the theater um, or a museum uh, in the after, late afternoon, and then you go to dinner again. So you're spending in the economy, whereas the business traveler who occupies that hotel room uh, goes to a meeting, uh, goes back to his room, does emails, has a coffee and a soup and goes to sleep. So very little extra spending and he's occupying that hotel room and not supporting the, the city. But if you suddenly have all these hotel rooms occupied by people who are investing considerably in spending in the city, then all the entrepreneurs that are providing these services suddenly have a huge amount of cash. And they start spending more on restaurants, more on theater, more on museum displays, more on everything, um, better shops, better, more beautifully displayed shops because they know they can generate more revenue. So it becomes um, a virtuous circle. I, I'm quite bullish about the future of cities, but not for corporate for corporate oriented hotels. Well, I'm actually uh, curious to see what Soneva in a city and an urban environment would look like, because it, the idea of Soneva is it doesn't make you want to leave. Uh, right. And if that happens in a city, uh, it'll be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But so, as we reach the end of our chat, um, yeah. let's lighten things up. Uh, I'm going to put to you 10 fun questions and I'd request you to please answer them in a similar lighthearted manner. Are we ready? Sure, sure. Question one, complete the sentence, luxury travel, true luxury travel stands for. True luxury travel stands for... Um, um, true happiness. When ideas from Soneva, like no news, no shoes, or movies under the stars get copied by other resorts, are you flattered or frustrated? Um, flattered because um, you can't copy our DNA and our culture and um, it runs true. So um, you might take a few apps, but you won't change the whole overall experience. What, according to you, is the biggest, bigger threat to the luxury travel industry, the pandemic or our depleting natural resources? Um, I think we can get over the pandemic and we have, as, as we've seen. Um, I think the issue is, is sustainability and the environment, of course. That, that's a huge threat for humanity as a whole, not just our industry. What would you tell a top dollar paying customer who's being destructive of nature at one of your resorts? Um, we, we would we would we would sort of explain the situation. Our, our hosts are very passionate. They've yeah. been with us for a long time, and they really passionate about our values. But we do it in a in a, in a in a nice way. In one line, describe the slow travel movement that you've propagated. Slow travel. I mean, essentially, it's it's um, offering our guests luxuries whilst minimizing our impact on their on 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 the planet and enhancing their health. So. Uh, sustainability, luxury and wellness, not being opposites, but feeding off each other. What's the first thing a guest must look for when checking into a luxury resort? Um, well, personally, um, I love food and wine. <laughs> so um, I, I sort the of <laughs> look at the restaurants, the menus. I do actually, and the wine list. So for me, that's quite important um, to look at. If I book a restaurant in a city, I'll look at their wine list um, and, and try and understand that because for me that's a very important experience. Um, I, I think it's the people. I think you you can tell when you check into a hotel. You can immediately tell whether you've come to the right place and whether there's really passionate, genuine hosts who really want to de deliver an experience. So it, it's it's one of those things you can tell when you've gone into a rotten hotel or a good hotel. Um, right. However luxurious the rotten hotel might look physically. Right. Which is the most luxurious resort you've been to other than one of your own? And tell us why you'd go there again. Right. Uh, we love North Island in the Seychelles. Again, it's one island, one resort. It's very private, very exclusive. It's barefoot. It's it's exactly what Suneva espouses to be. But it's not one of our own. So we feel very relaxed. You know, when we're in our own hotels, you know, we'll see something on the hell out of us. You see something wrong in another hotel. You don't mind, you're very relaxed about it. Um, we love that. Uh, we love Florence, uh, Villa San Michele up in Fiesole, sitting on the terrace there, looking down on Florence uh, with a nice bottle of um, 
good two, super Tuscan and old vintage um, and a nice spaghetti um is a nice experience. Fabulous. After the Maldives, your favorite island destination is? Oh, and I mustn't forget the peninsula. Peninsula Hong Kong is a really iconic hotel. Love it. Yeah. Right. Right. After the Maldives, Sonu, uh, your favorite island destination is? After the Maldives, my favorite island destination is? Ah, uh, good question. I think it's Se Seychelles. Seychelles. Yeah. The last two questions, uh, Instagram to luxury travel is a blessing or a curse? Um, I think if you use it correctly, it can be good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The biggest challenge for the luxury industry post the pandemic is? Biggest challenge for the luxury industry post the pandemic? Um, I think there's obviously volatility and I think with any crisis, if you can look at a crisis in a positive way and you can juggle, then I think it's um, it can be very positive. And the biggest opportunity is? The biggest opportunity for? Post the pandemic for the luxury travel industry. Oh, right. Um, yes, to, to reinforce and create a strong bond with your clients. Right. Especially in remote environments where you create, you know, your sense have a, clients have a sense of uh, comfort, care, protection. Um, if you can create unique experiences, people will, will want to come and they'll want to engage with you. So, Nushad Dasani, thank you for talking to us. What an absolute pleasure it's been. When they call your love story with Eva the toast of the travel world, they mean more than that. You've shown the luxury travel industry a sense of responsibility towards protecting the planet, and you've given your guests an ownership of our own future. Post-COVID, you are leading the way with initiatives big hotel groups are watching keenly. Thank you for joining us at the Hindustan Times Leadership Summit and giving us your view on luxury travel in the new world order. We wish you good health and every happiness that you strive so hard to impart to every guest who visits you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, and thank you once more for the honor. It's, it's been a pleasure. I enjoyed our, our conversation. Thank you.